Tonight, Alberta under fire from those bearing the brunt to those sharing the load. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Pray for rain. That prayer answered. We're with Canadian troops in an urgent fight on home soil. The political battle for health warning labels on alcohol products. This stands in stark contrast to what we have for tobacco and cannabis. My special access as Ukrainian soldiers get trained on Canadian tanks to defend their country. They really looking forward to using them in the future on the battlefield. This is The National with David Common. Good evening. Adrian is away. There is a welcome sight in parts of Alberta tonight, devastated by wildfires. Rain is falling and much more is forecast. That can bring its own concerns, but right now it's giving many hope that relief from the flames and smoke could be in sight. This evening, the number of active wildfires was decreasing. At 6.30 p.m. local time, Alberta was reporting 73 burning, 21 out of control. And if all this seems extreme, that's because it is. More area burned in Alberta this spring than ever before on record. Thousands of people are still out of their homes. Some no longer have one to go back to. Kayla Hounsell takes us about four hours northwest of Edmonton to a community hit hard and now trying to heal. It can't undo their devastation, but in a community filled with heartache, this is the first sign of renewal. Uplifting. Um, I haven't been happier to see rain <laughs> than I am now, yeah. yeah we Jessica Big Charles has lived on the East Prairie Métis settlement her entire life. Now her home is gone. It's devastating. We didn't even have time to grab, like, anything important or mem like pictures or nothing. We just had what we had on our backs. Holy shit. Fire has been threatening the community for more than two weeks. It raged through just hours after residents received an order to evacuate. It's like the second house that got burned. The chairman helped get everyone out as fast as he could. He says it's unclear how much today's rain has helped. I'm hoping. That's <laughs> all I could do is pray. And after weeks of battling relentless flames right across the province, this is not the only community sighing with relief today. Most of the areas of the province have now seen rain, lower temperatures and higher humidity, all of which will help firefighters gain ground on these wildfires. More than 10,000 Albertans are still out of their homes waiting for it to be safe enough to return. Supernault says here at East Prairie, that time is coming. We are going to start to heal. We've been healing as far as we're slowly coming home. He's been given the all clear that the threat has subsided. Now he's trying to get the power back on. But for 14 families here, there is no home to which they can return. All but one do not have insurance. It's so un, um, unforeseeable, like I am i don't know if I'm going to get a new home or where I'm going to live or how I'm going to move forward. What she does know is that she wants to rebuild here, the only home she's ever known. Hey Kayla, you're in nearby High Prairie now. Is there a sense of how much this rain is actually helping the situation across the province? Well, David, most areas of the province got some of this rain. Fire officials say there was rain to varying amounts on almost every wildfire burning in this province, except in the far north. They say it was helpful and will allow firefighters to make some real progress, but it was not the long, steady rain they had been hoping for. Now, there is more significant rain in the forecast for tomorrow, but officials are warning this is not over yet. In northern Alberta, there remains a very high to extreme risk for fire, David. Kayla Hounsell, thanks very much. Canada's wildfire seasons are getting worse and climate-related disasters are happening with alarming frequency all over the world. In a report today, the UN Weather Agency said the cost of these disasters is climbing. But as Susanna Da Silva tells us, there is some good news. The scramble is on to feed survivors of one of the most powerful cyclones to hit Bangladesh and Myanmar. We hope to reach at least 800,000 people 
who are considered in greatest need. Despite the devastation, as of now, the death toll is around 150, thousands less than previous storms, with the credit being given to early warning systems that saw hundreds of thousands get to safety in time. A new United Nations report says despite increasing climate disasters, fewer lives are being lost, though the financial costs are skyrocketing. The report cites close to 12,000 climate disasters over the last five decades that have taken the lives of over 2 million people at a cost of $5.8 trillion Canadian. Billions of those dollars have been spent on disasters here in Canada. Oh my God, my chain's gone. Like the fire that leveled much of the village of Lytton, B.C. almost two years later, and millions will still be needed as most of the rebuilding hasn't even started. The, the village is actually um, looking at a number of things to get us moving forward faster. So we're on a little bit of a pause right now and we're reassessing. Our economic analysis projects that on a, on a household basis, climate change is already costing the average household uh, over $1,000 a year. Money spent by those directly affected or through tax dollars. Projections from the Canadian Climate Institute say Canada will spend billions of dollars more every year to repair damage from disasters if more isn't done to prepare and to prevent them. So we can eliminate 75% of the economic risk of climate change by supporting global greenhouse gas reduction uh, and by investing proactively in building resilience. Investment scientists say need to happen quickly. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. We'll find out tomorrow whether former Governor General David Johnston will recommend a public inquiry into foreign interference. The independent special rapporteur was tasked with assessing Chinese interference in Canadian elections and what the government knew about it. If an inquiry is called, it could subpoena witnesses, hear testimony and request and examine documents. There are signs of progress tonight towards a deal to avoid a worst-case scenario in the U.S. That's the one where the world's largest economy runs out of money to pay its bills. Think welfare checks and the salaries of federal employees and military members. The ricochet from which, as Paul Hunter tells us, would be felt here in this country too. We do have disagreements, I think. There they sat. Republican yeah. Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy and U.S. President Joe Biden set to try to hammer out the so far unhammerable. An agreement by lawmakers on Capitol Hill to raise what's known as the debt ceiling, permission to increase the amount of money the U.S. can borrow to pay its bills. Lawmakers met on the Hill this weekend trying but failing to find a way forward. It's so serious. Biden returned from the G7 in Japan, intent on the sit-down with McCarthy, hoping to strike a deal and to avoid what some fear could be economic catastrophe if talks fail. A recession, spiked interest rates, and more. Economists describe the showdown bluntly. I feel like it just shows the rest of the world how dysfunctional our government has been over the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, in my eyes, we're playing Russian roulette with the United States credit. And by the way, what happens here could play out well beyond America's borders, not least in Canada. Canada knows that as the U.S. goes, so do we. And so if they were to uh, go into a recession, if their slowdown were to be more prolonged than otherwise, they could take us with them. Among other demands, Republicans want caps on government spending. Democrats prefer to raise money and largely maintain spending. So who will blink and when? The deadline for a deal is in less than two weeks, sparking memories of 2011, when under Barack Obama, a deal came with just 72 hours to spare. We may be able to make some progress. In the Oval Office, guarded we optimism. And we still have some disagreements, but I think we may be able to get where we have to go. Uh, said McCarthy afterward. Uh, I felt we had a productive uh, discussion. We don't have an agreement yet. I believe we can still get there. Okay, Paul, does that mean there's reason to be optimistic? Hey, David, yeah, well, yes and no. Uh, yes, because McCarthy also said, uh, in his view, the tone tonight was better than at any other time in these ongoing talks. But despite what you heard in that clip, 
He also said there remain big differences on how this country should govern itself in terms of the money it spends. And the clock is a ticking, David. The stakes remain sky high. All right. So we need to stay tuned. CC's Paul Hunter in Washington. Thank you. You're welcome. Facebook's parent company says it will appeal a record-breaking fine from the European Union's privacy regulator. The rebuke, to the tune of more than $1.7 billion Canadian, was for storing the data of EU citizens in the U.S. Along with the fine, Meta was given five months to stop that practice. Russia finds itself in an unusual position tonight, trying to recapture its own territory. Self-described freedom fighters have seized an area in Russia near the Ukrainian border. Thomas Degg has more on the attack and who's behind it. Amid the green countryside of western Russia, that heavy white smoke signals trouble. An attack that Moscow says was organized in Ukraine but apparently carried out by Russians opposed to the Kremlin. A group calling itself the Liberty of Russia Legion claimed responsibility with this video. The man saying, don't be afraid because we're coming home. Russia will be free. Russian TV told viewers the search is on for Ukrainian saboteurs, but the attacker's ties to Kyiv may be more murky. While they may be supplied by Ukraine, they're actually Russian nationals or Russian citizens, so that the Ukrainian forces themselves are not, in fact, attacking Russia proper. Since the invasion of Ukraine started last year, Russia has seen repeated explosions within its borders. But this time, social media video purports to show those Russian rebels capturing a Russian military vehicle. Apparently even driving one away in broad daylight. The governor of Russia's Belgorod region vowed his territory would be cleared of the enemy. Ukraine distanced itself from the incursion, focusing instead on the symbolic city of Bakhmut, where Kiev's forces insist they're still defending territory. We are not ready to die just because some neighbor does not want us to exist. Fighters recently raised the flags of Russia and its Wagner private army in Bakhmut, declaring it's under their full control. But that might not be enough. To keep the city in their hands and then continue further west is going to be very, very difficult. Russian rebels appeared to fly their opposition flag over Moscow, suggesting Russia may have more battles to fight on its side of the border. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Very difficult story to tell you about in western Guyana, where a fire burned a school dormitory to the ground. 20 people died. At least 19 of them were children. This is a horrific incident. It's tragic. It's painful. Guyana's president said the focus was on helping survivors as the government mounted a medical evacuation. Firefighters say that by the time they arrived, the dormitory was already engulfed in flames. The school is in a remote area. Many of the students are indigenous. The cause is under investigation. Ireland is now the world's first country calling for labels to warn that alcohol carries serious risk of disease. The health minister signed that into law today and the industry has two years to start complying. The labels will have to address the risk of liver disease and cancer and also show the calorie count. Italy, Spain and other EU countries call the move an attack on their wine industries. Here in Canada, a fight is being waged to adopt similar warning labels led by a senator who's a recovering alcoholic. Despite a steep rise in deaths related to drinking, J.P. Tasker shows us the senator's bill faces pushback. The drinks are flowing at one of the country's top restaurants, but a possible change to liquor laws has the owner worried. I think the way that it's being proposed uh, is, is detrimental to our, our business. If a new bill passes Parliament, there will be health warnings on all these bottles. I just think that uh, labeling on each bottle is, uh, you know, potentially uh, a huge amount of red tape. Patrick Brazo introduced the legislation. You know, I was drinking uh, way too much because I, I was hurting inside. I was trying to, uh, to kill the pain. He's a recovering alcoholic on a mission to warn Canadians about just how dangerous liquor can be. I mean, there's 80% of Canadians who, who drink alcohol, and that's okay. But only 25% are aware that 
The consumption of just a little bit of alcohol can cause cancers. Dozens of countries around the world already demand warnings on beer, wine and spirits. Yukon tried it in 2017. Sales dropped by more than 6% before the project was scrapped. Brazo says that's why there's such strong opposition from the industry. They're doing everything that they can, spending tons and tons of money to ensure that Canadians are left in the dark. There's been a pandemic-fueled boom in alcohol-related death. It's up 18% in three years. According to federal research, liquor consumption caused some 17,000 deaths last year. This stands in stark contrast to what we have for tobacco and cannabis. This researcher says it's not clear why alcohol gets a pass on labeling. This can of corn has more data than a bottle of hard liquor. To my knowledge, uh, niblet corn did not kill 17,000 Canadians last year. The federal government says it's still reviewing the legislation. Brazo's not hopeful it'll pass given pressure from some lobby groups. But he's got 26 years left in this place. He says he won't drop the fight until he's forced into retirement. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. The federal government has made strides on a different health care file, dental care. But advocates say Canadians living with disabilities will continue to be left behind. Their call, focus on patient needs and train dentists to meet them. Bethany Lindsay shows us how. So, how is your tongue? It's good. Joanne Shimakawa has MS. She used to be okay transferring to the dentist chair. After three years and a little bit of progression, I just don't want to take a chance standing up anymore. I prefer to be able to stay in my wheelchair. So she started looking for a dentist in Toronto who could treat her in her chair. Basically took every dentist in the West End and called them one after another. And this office said, yes, of course we take people in wheelchairs, but it's the only place that I found who would accept. The Canadian Society for Disability and Oral Health says it's an issue that needs urgent attention. Clinics are often inaccessible, and dental professionals rarely have experience treating patients with disabilities. We want to get people so they can speak and smile, have good self-esteem, they can chew their food and not have stomach problems. His organization has written to the federal health minister saying too many patients with disabilities don't have access to regular preventative care. They touch and they, we talk. Dr. Salome specializes in patients with disabilities. So many colleagues told me, why you're doing this? Uh, you should quit and dedicate your profession to doing implants or doing regular care. You're going to make more money. And also, every time I was trying to find a training or a course or something, there was all outside Canada. McGill University's dental school does run clinics for some kids and adults with disabilities, but the dean says education is a major barrier. Until we have trained dentists, we cannot really totally uh, address uh, the needs. The Canadian Dental Association admits there are gaps in care. They hope the government's new $250 million oral health access fund will help address that. As for Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos, he says he'll carefully consider all feedback while the new dental plan is being developed. Yeah, we need to change these feelings. Joanne Shimakawa just wishes it wasn't so hard to get reliable care. I think for anybody who cares a lot about their teeth, it's really important that you have access to get your teeth taken care of. Bethany Lindsay, CBC News, Vancouver. An area of mining in B.C. is under scrutiny tonight with concerns about the environmental impacts on certain fish species in Canada and the U.S. The river to us is our lifeblood. The river to us is our veins. The Indigenous groups fighting to protect their waterways next. Plus, Canadian reservists on the front line of the Alberta wildfires. What we're entering right now is the command post of the domestic response company. Ellen Morrow with exclusive access to the ongoing mission. And a little later, how this fawn was given a chance to live after tragedy on the road. It was trying its darndest to get out and it couldn't get out. The Ontario man who delivered her to safety. We're back in two.
And we have confirmation that the Axiom 2 crew has docked to the International Space Station at 812 a.m. Central. And with that, the second all-private astronaut crew has boarded the ISS. Among the four new crew members, stem cell researcher Rihanna Bernawi, the first woman from Saudi Arabia to go to space. Altogether, they'll spend about 10 days conducting more than 20 experiments. Well, how do you like this job? Wildlife officials in Florida capturing an alligator they say bit off a man's arm. It happened Sunday morning in this pond. The man was helped to shore and flown to hospital where he's said to be recovering. The more than three meter long gator was later euthanized. Coal mines in southern B.C. are endangering aquatic life and polluting waterways on both sides of the border. Researchers say exposure to a chemical called selenium may cause deformities and a decline in the fish population. Corey Bullock on the problems and the pledge from Washington and Ottawa to safeguard the watershed. At this fish hatchery in Idaho, a team of experts are working to restore the population of the Kootenai River's white sturgeon an endangered species in decline due to human activity. We've invested a lot of money, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars over decades to try to reverse that decline. And now there's another issue that we have to deal with. That issue, selenium, a chemical that's naturally occurring, but in high concentrations, it can affect fish health and reproduction. And it's being found in the Kootenai. The concern with selenium is that it can lead to uh, deformities in the young, young fish. If you get enough deformities in the trout, then you, the population could, could decline. The problem starts here in BC, the Canadian section of the Kootenai. Selenium leaches from waste rock that's created by four coal mines in the Elk Valley. The river to us is our lifeblood. The river to us is our veins. American and Canadian Indigenous groups say the mining company Tech Resources has been polluting the watershed that straddles the border for years. They want an international commission to study the mine's impact. So that uh, they can come to conclusions that either support the, the concerns that we've been raising or to uh, make some other suggestions about how we might move forward. In a statement to CBC News, Tech says it's already invested more than a billion dollars in four water treatment facilities with the goal of reducing selenium in the watershed. And millions more will be spent to construct additional facilities. But experts say a quick fix isn't possible. In the long term, that selenium issue will persist. Um, and selenium will continue to leach out of these rocks for the next 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000 years. Talks about how to mitigate water pollution from the Elk Kootenai watershed are ongoing. Ottawa says it hopes to reach an agreement in principle with the U.S., tribal nations and Indigenous groups by summer to protect this vital environment. Corey Bullock, CBC News, near Cranbrook, B.C. With no let-up in Alberta's wildfires, Canada's military has stepped up to help. We're with the reservists deployed to fight the flames. I've never done anything like this before, and it's very hard work. Ellen Morrow gets exclusive access behind the scenes of a dangerous operation. And for many Canadians, it's still hard to believe he's gone. To be in love is to be insane. Gordon Lightfoot's legacy from the musicians who loved him. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world next. As dozens of wildfires burn in Alberta, many of them out of control, more Canadian Armed Forces members are now helping to fight them. About 400 soldiers in total. Ellen Morrow got exclusive access to one military command post for an inside look at the dangerous and complex operation. The end of a long, exhausting day battling Alberta's wildfires. I've never done anything like this before, and it's very hard work. When the fire first started, like, we had no idea when it was going to stop, right? It was, it was a very scary time. Everyone's all right? Healthy? Yes, okay, yes, good job. You guys can head in and get cleaned up. These are reserve troops from across the province, called into action from their normal lives, ready for a long fight. So a lot of times when these things come up, it's, it's our job to do them. This is home for now, a community centre turned military barracks in Drayton Valley. 
The stress of the mission etched on so many faces. But so too is relief after a grueling 12-hour shift. How was your day today, Alexis? Did you have a good day at school? The only time for moments like this. Are you too goofy? Oh, there you go. These soldiers have been on the front lines of this wildfire for days, living at this Canadian Armed Forces Command post in Drayton Valley. And they only have a few hours for dinner and some rest before they have to go out and do it all over again. What we're entering right now is the command post of the domestic response company. This whole operation, maps, supplies, communications, put together in just a few hours. A zero, roger, out. Major Sean Fletcher of the 41 Canadian Brigade Group is in charge. In normal times, a Calgary geologist. Oh, that's where that uh, peat fire is, right? Correct. Okay, thanks for that. Now a commander worried about his troops. We can live track our soldiers. This is really important for me as a commander because they're in dangerous situations out here. And if something happens, we can get medical attention to them immediately. Is there anxiety for you? There is. Sometimes I feel guilty I'm not out there with them fighting the fire. <laughs> This is what their days look like, digging up smoking ash, trying to stop this fire from sparking up again. Few have formal firefighter training, so they all watch out for each other. Was good? Where's that Where's Wilson? The worst of the fire in Drayton Valley is out, but the work here is not easy. Just tell her when you're ready. Lugging hoses and gear, breathing in dangerous air, all in nearly 30 degree heat. When everything's burning down around you, it's, it's kind of either you help or you don't. This moment weighs especially heavy for Private Scott Storm, an oil worker from Drayton Valley. The fire here so devastating, residents were forced to stay away for nearly two weeks. How do you feel when you see the damage in your community? Uh, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been a lot worse, but through the efforts of everybody here involved, we, uh, we mitigated that as best we could. We'll take a look at where the soldiers are sleeping. While the troops are out working, Major Fletcher gives us a tour of the makeshift setup. I think this was probably the curling rink. There are 125 reservists based here. Wake up is 5 a.m., lights out is 10. There's no privacy and very little comfort. I am just taken aback seeing all, all these cots and thinking about the hours they're working out there in really, really tough conditions. And then this is what they come back to. It could be worse. Many of the soldiers across the wildfire zone are sleeping in tents. There's a hard roof over our heads. So for us in the military, this is luxury. That could change at a moment's notice. So here we have all of the chainsaws, right. we have tarps, we have lighting equipment in case we go into austere conditions. As the fires shift, Major Fletcher's troops will likely get redeployed to areas under greater threat. We actually go through uh, the most efficient way to load our vehicles up and leave. <laughs> Wake up the next morning comes quickly. Was I asleep? Let's go back. Okay, look. Like... On go those ash stained uniforms, boots laced up, a few snacks, and they're ready to go. Fatigue must be beginning to set in, but no one here really shows it. You got your, your buddy next to you and he kind of makes sure you're good throughout the day. Just, you know, just you kind of do it. I don't know. Just, it's kind of a keep calm and carry on sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, exactly. Remember Private Storm? He's grateful for his fellow soldiers here helping his community. It's very surreal and it means a lot. I mean, it hits right here for me. What do you think when you think about the coming days and months if this drags on all summer? It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Pray for rain. Rain is about the only thing that would bring Alberta a reprieve. Until then, this battle drags on. That was Ellen Morrow in Drayton Valley, Alberta. We do know that rain is expected to fall there tonight 
and tomorrow. The brigade is also now on the move. They're heading next to the Edson area to help fight another wildfire. While those troops are engaged in important work at home, others have been deployed on more traditional work abroad, including helping Ukrainian soldiers master the use of eight Leopard 2 tanks donated by Canada. Several weeks ago, I got a first-hand look at the Canadian training to put that firepower to battlefield use. Here's another look. As Ukraine fights for its survival, we're taking you inside Canada's mission to help redefine the battle space. Rare access to live fire learning. This is a crash course tank school. Less than a month to take Ukrainian soldiers off the front lines, bring them here to Poland and train them on those Leopard tanks. To do that, Canadian soldiers were called up with barely any notice to come here. Tank training grounds in Poland, next door to Ukraine, but a world away from its violence. So you want to stay kind of further back because uh, the stab system is on, which means that the turret could move around at any time. And Edmonton base captain Brittany Shkagizis runs the program to convert experienced Ukrainian tank crews into Leopard specialists. So. How long have you been on those? I've been uh, doing tank stuff for about three years. What do you think of them? I love them. There's nowhere else I'd rather be than on my tank doing maneuver, doing shooting, anything. It's nothing beats it for me. The Ukrainians may already be the most battle hardened tank fighters in the world. Observation regime. And we're going to be shooting in turret ops. We're going to be shooting eight rounds per tank today. In the comparative safety of neighboring Poland, dozens of Canadian soldiers are training those veteran Ukrainians on fighting with a tank far more sophisticated than the Soviet era models they've been using so far. Better targeting, better range, better maneuverability, better protection. During the training, we could. Uh... Polish Captain Konrad Stefanovic knows all about making that switch. His country hosting not just the training, but driving the donations of dozens of Western tanks for Ukraine. How are they finding the differences between the Ukrainian tanks they've been using and the Western tanks they're about to be able to use? Mm, they really appreciate this tank, they see its advantages, and to be honest, this tank uh, has no. This tank has only advantages over the Soviet-made tanks and they are really looking forward to using them in the future on the battlefield. Canada has sent more than 100,000 rounds of ammunition, plus eight of its own Leopard tanks, the oldest in the Canadian Armed Forces. They are now bound for the front line, so the vehicles used for training are Poland's own. So the loader will be on this side. Gunner and commander on this side, and then the driver is in the hull on the uh, right side down there. We're not permitted to show the faces of Ukrainian soldiers for their protection, but they are eager to be here, away from the grueling, relentless, bloody fight for inches being fought in towns and across vast fields just like this. What do you want to see these tanks do in Ukraine? The goal is destroy the enemy, chuckles this Ukrainian major. His name is being withheld, but he does say he had retired from the army before being pulled back by war to train a new generation on newer tanks. Do you, do you think the Russians will be scared? They're already scared, he tells us but we need more ammunition as well. Indeed, there are no illusions here. The donated Leopard tanks from Canada and European nations combined with Challenger tanks from Britain and Abrams from the US will no doubt help Ukraine, but it won't turn the tide on its own. Many of these trainees may not survive for long. It's a, you know, it's a difficult subject, but uh, people die in war, and in this war, a lot of people are dying. How is it for you knowing that some of the people that you're training now may end up being killed on the battlefield? Uh, that's a very hard question, but, uh, well, we expect that there will be some casualties. This tank isn't invincible. It's uh, 
one of the top of the world, but every kind of equipment can be destroyed and there will be wounded, there will be killed, of course, but that's, that's how it is during the war. We just hope that our training will have those skills, the experience to, to minimize those casualties and to maximize the effectiveness of the use of this equipment so they can win the war quicker and with less wounded, less dead soldiers, fewer dead soldiers. See that barrel carefully shifting? It's tracking a moving target two kilometers away. The Leopard's capable of striking more than twice that distance, day or night, hunting while hidden and still or on the move. This just missed the target, but most rounds find it perfectly. The Canadians adding their learning from the Ukrainians as much as their teaching. A brutal war of attrition wages just one nation away. Soon this group of soldiers will be back in it, back to be the first to use leopards in this conflict, and new soldiers will come here to be trained. A cycle likely to continue until this war somehow ends. As of last month, the Minister of Defence said that all of Canada's donated Leopard 2s had arrived in Poland. Other allies have confirmed that at least some of their tanks have made it into Ukraine. But there have been no confirmed sightings of them on the battlefield yet. When we come back... Canada and the world are still coming to terms with the loss of a music legend. He wasn't just writing songs, he was painting Canada. What Gordon Lightfoot meant to some of Canada's most prominent musicians. That's next. On this Victoria Day weekend 49 years ago, Gordon Lightfoot's haunting ballad Sundown was rising fast on the Billboard Hot 100 on its way to being his first and only number one hit in the U.S. Three weeks ago, Lightfoot's death set off a wave of tributes and memories. Canadian artists told us how they were influenced by his music and his personal warmth. Once again, here's Deanna Sumanak johnson with their tales of Gordon Lightfoot. We're here at Toronto's Massey Hall. Some people call it the House of Gord. Gordon Lightfoot performed here 170 times, so it's a huge part of his legacy. And there is, of course, another part of his legacy, and that's his influence on Canadian songwriters and musicians. We got a chance to speak to some of them. If you could read my mind, love, what a tale my thoughts could tell. Just like an old time movie about a ghost from a wishing well. No, he went into my blood. I didn't, uh, I still don't think of him a uh, singer songwriter guy. I think of him as a communicator and somebody that resonated with me so deeply as a child. I have this through line that every artist begins in their kitchen and the music that they listen to when they're growing up. And for me, that was Gordon Lightfoot in the kitchen. He had a way with words in that he wasn't just writing songs, he was painting Canada. Every time you drop a needle on one of his songs, one of his records, his voice is going to unleash a joy in your heart that you maybe forgot was there. To be in love is to be insane. Take an old man, grow a young man. Musicians from coast to coast wanted to talk about what they learned from Lightfoot. Key lessons, staying true to who you are and where you come from. His voice had uh, it always gave a shade of melancholy to everything he sang. As much as he would try to do songs that were super happy, they always had, you always were wondering like, what's, what's behind all this? Because that was what his voice did, that's what his voice said. We as Canadians uh, have that talent in us to observe and to write about what we see. We could reference uh, Gordon Lightfoot as, as somebody who did just that. He wrote um, about what he lived through and what was around him. He taught us a lot about the country, whether it was history or the geography, but also about the heart and soul of the humans in the country. You know, the darkness and the uh, sense of 
loneliness that he's saying about as well, the, the, the solitude, and uh, I think those are deeply Canadian and deeply universal sentiments that, uh, that as a songwriter, I really learned a lot from later in life. I was born to Many of the artists we spoke to had a memorable story about meeting Lightfoot, a consummate musician always interested in what his peers were up to. I only met Gordon Lightfoot one time in my life, out at a folk festival. And he just stood there and he had, you know, his nice shirt on, his jacket. And he's like, Jan, I've always wanted to meet you. I'm like, what? Come on. And I, I really didn't know what to say. And then he just said, do you mind if I do a couple of songs before you're set? And I'm like, you can do the whole damn 75 minutes if you want to. And he goes, no, no. I think he was really a big fan of everybody else's, I think. You think about his kind words and to me of encouragement as a singer-songwriter myself. And um, I mean, the first time I ever met him, I gave him my CD and he turned to me and said, uh, will you sign it? And I said, what? He says, well, it's not a Gordon Lightfoot CD. And it's a Julian Taylor CD. So I said, oh, okay, sure. I'd love to sign your CD. So I signed it to Gordon Lightfoot. When my solo record came out and I first played Massey Hall, um, Gordon had these seats that were about 12 rows back on the on stage right side, and there's where the seats he always sat in. And I looked at him, and he was there, so it was nice. Played my show. Next day, I get a call from Gordon. And that's pretty odd, you know, I want to tell my wife, it's Gordon Lightfoot. And uh, he said, you got two bands. How come you got two bands? It's so hard to have one band, and you got two. And that sort of started this uh, conversation between us that we carried on for years. Every such a big hole that it was still um, a shock and uh, very sad. I love the fact that Gordon died with uh, tour dates on the books that he had to be supposed to fulfill. You know, that's like, it's like a musician's dream. When I started playing guitar, playing with other people, uh, you know, there's Neil Young and Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen and those people that I found fascinating, but Gordon spoke in a language that was to me. There will never be anyone like him ever again and I think what he has left behind him will last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and that is something. In mid-July, a live recording will go on sale, billed as Gordon Lightfoot's final album. Entitled At Royal Albert Hall, it was recorded in 2016 at that famous London concert venue. I've got a place in my heart for animals, and I think every life's important. After a vehicle killed its mother, learn how an Ontario man delivered this newborn fawn in our moment. All right, this little cutie is Schutz, which translates to, to sweet treasure in German. And the story of her birth is what makes her so precious. Jürgen Manhart saw a deer had been struck by a vehicle last week, but he noticed movement and jumping into action delivered a newborn fawn after the mother had died. His compassion is our moment. I was heading to King Garden Monday morning at 5.30 and I come upon a big mess on the road and as I passed it, I noticed something moved and when something moved, I just, my heart sunk. I spun around, I could see the mother deer laying in the ditch and then this, this head poked out. It was trying its darndest to get out and it couldn't get out and so I picked it up and I put it in the back of my car just snugged it up and, and put a blanket over it. I ended up calling a rescue place down in Strathroy. So anyways, we got her down there and everything was fine. And uh, I've had pictures from the rehab center since, but she's, she's doing great. She's doing really well. And actually she's together with another fawn that they had down there. I, I, I was choking back tears because I, I was looking at the mother 
this little thing's lost its mother, it's lost its sibling. I've got a place in my heart for animals, and I think every life's important. So if there's something you can do for them, do it. Something good coming out of something tragic. Uh, little Shut will be released back into the wild, likely uh, September or October. And uh, you saw her drinking from a bottle there even before that. Manhart had actually been feeding her with a syringe just to keep her hydrated. That is The National for May 22nd. I'm David Common. Have a great night.